All right, now that we have a really good laser pointer. So Kevin has set you up with essentially um, how the model works. And what I would like to show you now are some of the results from this model basically in tabular form to give you some figures in terms of potential marsh loss in the future as a result of what the model is telling us. So first, uh, with our project, uh, we basically ran all the scenarios and Kevin produced all these maps, so we've accomplished that. The next part of our goal was to essentially identify these vulnerable wetlands. These are the wetlands that essentially will drown in place and actually won't migrate. Then, of course, we wanted to identify the affected upland areas. So the maps that Kevin showed are those parcels that are highlighted in yellow. Those are parcels that have today coastal wetlands on them and that will have coastal wetlands in the future uh, as well. The other part of our project was to develop some new policies and some adaptive management techniques that we could bring into our coastal program as part of the beach SAMP process, and we'll be talking a lot more of that um, in the near future. And finally, we wanted to also provide this information to local communities so that they could use this information in their comprehensive plans, whether they use it as part of zoning overlays or conservation efforts to help prioritize um, conservation easements or a land acquisition to ensure the viability of coastal marshes um, in the future. So again, the first thing we wanted to do is identify these critical wetlands. So using some criteria, we use the Audubon Society's um, important bird areas, and those are highlighted um, with these red stars here. And these are the important bird areas that are salt marshes in the state. Now, an example would be the Galilee uh, Bird Sanctuary. The other is existing large marshes. So any marsh complex that was greater than 25 acres in size, this happens to be Colt State Park, and here's a large marsh complex here, greater than 25 acres. The other thing are these rare communities, uh, sea level fence, and there are two of them known in Rhode Island. These are where you have upland seepage of freshwater wetlands that are right at that interface at the high marsh, and so they get flooded very irregularly, and it has a unique vegetative community that's only found in two places in Rhode Island. These are rare communities up and down the East Coast. And finally, um, salt marshes that will be 25 acres or greater in the future if, in fact, these salt marshes can migrate landward. And here is a big example of marsh up along the Kikimua River uh, in Warren. So these are our critical wetland areas. Kevin showed you this map, and here is an example of where we have sort of um, unfettered marsh migration, if you will. These are large open parcels right here that are undeveloped, and you'll see the marsh migrates quite easily across that landscape. This is the Palmer River, this is Warren, this is Barrington here. In this case, however, we have marsh migration where we ran the model in the unrestricted mode, as Kevin said, we allow the marsh to migrate into the developed area despite the fact that the development is there with all other factors being equal that would allow for marsh migration. And you can see the erratic nature of the marsh migration and you can see here the outline of how it fits very precisely with mowed lawns and driveways, um, et cetera. So what are some of the changes that we're seeing from the model? Well, uh, with sea level rise of one foot, we're going to lose 450 acres of salt marsh in Rhode Island. This is just salt marsh. With three feet here, we're going to lose almost 1,900 acres. That's about half of today's existing salt marshes. So half of today's existing salt marsh will drown with three feet of sea level rise, and with five feet um, significantly more. 
Now, of course, the model projects that there will be some gains and that marsh, if they are allowed to migrate into the upland areas and they are in fact viable vegetative wetlands in the future and there's still some uncertainty there, uh, we're going to see some gains here in these marshes. However, the bottom line is that the net change is we're still going to have dramatic losses despite the gains with three and five feet of sea level rise. Now, if we break it down by community, we certainly have um, some very significant losses in these communities. Portsmouth, Narragansett, Charlestown, and Barrington, not surprisingly, Barrington, a low-lying community in the East Bay. These are really big losses of over 300 acres in these four communities for a total coastal wetlands. So this is not only salt marsh, but also these fringe brackage and brackish marshes and the transitional areas abutting these salt marshes. So we're looking at five feet of sea level rise. We're looking at about 3,000 acres of coastal wetland loss at five feet. We're also going to see, um, and very surprising to us, some very significant losses of freshwater wetlands. These are freshwater wetlands that are in close proximity to the coastline. In this case, uh, this is Middle Bridge Road, um, the narrow river here, and this is the town-owned property here that the town in Narragansett owns, and that circled area is a cattail marsh. It's a freshwater marsh, but it abuts the salt marsh. And there it is again, you, this is familiar because Kevin showed you this, there's that cattail marsh there in the circle, and there it is at three feet. And what it says here is that that is going to convert over to salt marsh with three feet of sea level rise. The question that we have though in the future is, will this be viable salt marsh? Or with tidal influence killing that vegetation because of the high saline concentrations, will it be an open water body for a long period of time before it becomes vegetated with salt marsh? Those are the questions that we're uncertain about. Nevertheless, here are the losses when you break them down by community. Uh, with one foot of sea level rise, we're going to lose 204 acres of freshwater wetlands in the entire state. With three feet, we're going to triple that. And with five feet, we're going to have close to 1,100 acres of freshwater wetland loss in the state. And of course, not surprisingly, Barrington leads the way as one of those low-lying communities as is Warren, Westerly on the South Shore, South Kingstown, and Charlestown on the South Shore. Not surprising. So let me run through a couple of opportunities and challenges, and then I'll hand the presentation over to Caitlin Chafee. So we're going to look at three different examples here, Foster Cove in Charlestown, the uh, Great Creek or Round Marsh in Jamestown, and the Palmer River in Barrington. And so we'll start here. Uh, many of you have experienced high tides. Here's North Road looking north and uh, if you've been on this roadway you know that it's elevated up on this end and on the southern end as you come into town it's elevated again. This is the low point in the road and this is just past Zeke's Creek Bait Shop where you can buy lobsters there on the side of the road as well. So here we are, here's that photo looking up North Road. There's a water treatment plant here. There's a lot of farmland here. Uh, the Turnpike and Bridge Authority for the Newport Jamestown Bridge and of course the Jamestown Municipal Golf. So here's one foot of sea level rise. And again, the yellow here represents existing marsh today that will persist with one foot of sea level rise. Now with three feet, you start seeing purple creeping in, and that's marsh that will now be lost. But now you're seeing the brown area of marsh expanding into the upland areas. And at five feet, it's even more dramatic. One of these challenges, we'll go back to the three foot because that's more near term. So one of the opportunities here is to relocate the access to that water treatment plant. Another might be to consider elevating that roadway between the high points. Maybe it's a causeway 
uh, to eliminate flooding of that road with sea level rise and even storm events. Another here is perhaps working with the agricultural um, property owners here in the Nature Conservancy um, in terms of looking at different agricultural practices to allow for that marsh to migrate um, into that agricultural land. Perhaps it's even managing the golf course a li little bit differently, like Wenley had described in, earlier in her presentation. And lastly, we probably want to protect this area so that the Bridge and Turnpike Authority can continue to operate and people can get across. In Barrington and Warren here, the pond, again, one foot, three foot, and five foot. And let's opportunities and challenges here. Well, here again, along this area that's already highly developed, um, perhaps shortening roads up. Um, and allowing marsh to revert on, on those ends that are not being used and still allow public access in, into the river. Um, here, a lot of this, these parcels are protected already, so that should be an easy transition for marsh to make it into upland areas. And again, here, a large wetland complex, relatively undeveloped, so that could allow for marsh migration. Here, you may want to think about um, these wetlands that are going to convert and transition to coastal marsh in the future. And perhaps the golf course here, which will be highly impacted, and I think we're losing our battery on this. Um, the uh, golf course here uh, is going to be highly impacted by marsh migration in the future. And so maybe it it means moving fairways. Uh, that's a discussion to have. The last example I want to show you is Foster Cove in Charleston. And we'll focus in here um, on Wildflower Drive. So there's this brackish wetland here. And then here's the uh, salt marsh here. And this is flooded uh, at a high tide. And again, this is familiar. Kevin, three, five feet. And now, with open water, a substantial amount of inundation, uh, particularly on the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And here we have some open land opportunity where we can conserve that into the future and allow for coastal wetland migration. Certainly, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service may want to assess their management activities uh, to accommodate wetlands into the future. So where's all this data? Um, right now, uh, the Coastal Resources Management Council is out to public notice to adopt the SLAM maps. And so this is the index that we've prepared. Uh, and these are the 149 map panels. And for each map panel covering all 21 coastal communities, you'll see a four map panel set showing the initial current condition of the wetlands as they were in 2010, followed by one, three, and five feet of sea level rise and the change in the marsh over that period of time. This is the web page, and you access the web page at that address, crmc.ri.gov. Um, you will scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll see, all right, um, we're losing the pointer. So we're going to use a real pointer. There you go. So here are the 21 coastal maps. These are PDF files. And I will warn you now that some of them are as large as 50 megabytes because there's a lot of map panels associated with towns like South Kingstown, for example, and Barrington. Um, so you will just click on one of those PDF files, and I would advise you to load it to your desktop and save it on your desktop, your town of interest, and that way you can open it up like in Adobe or some other PDF viewer so it opens up much quicker. In addition, uh, all the work that Kevin has done with this map work, all this GIS data will be loaded up later this year up to RIGIS, the Rhode Island Geographic Information System, so that people will be able to download it and use it uh, at their community level or whatever type of planning that you might be doing. 
I also want to mention that the, uh, as Grover had mentioned earlier on, the Executive Climate Change Coordinating Council issued its report um, in June of this year, and one of the action items on that was that the CRMC would adopt the SLAM app. So we're carrying forth with that action item, and you can go to that website at the bottom there to actually look at the EC4's uh, webpage for climate change activities. It has also been mentioned that next week, Jen West, there you are, Jen, up there, you're going to be leading um, this municipal training, and we're going to be talking a little bit more nitty-gritty with municipal planners and other local officials as to how to access and use these maps and how can they be useful in your community. A couple of other recent uh, publications of court, well, one publication on the left, which will be useful for land trusts, is um, building the capacity to adapt through climate change. And certainly sea level rise is one of the issues you need to be thinking about if you're conserving land along the coast. And then, of course, the Rhode Island Climate Change .org website. And lastly, this is all part of the beach stamp. This is one big project to look at coastal vulnerability, infrastructure, our natural resources, our eroding shorelines, our changing shorelines, and what are we going to be doing about it in the future. So this is just a little snippet of information from our SLAM project, and I will